Thank you very much, Aziza. It's really my pleasure to uh, moderate uh, this session. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome to the session on circular cities and regions, how to measure progress of the third OECD roundtable on circular economy in cities and regions. Uh, my name is Stefano Marta, and I'm the coordinator of the OECD program on a territorial approach to the SDGs. Uh, welcome to our distinguished speaker, the panelists, and to all the participants joining the roundtable today. Uh, you can use the chat function to say who you are and uh, where you're joining us from. And uh, for those of you who just connected, allow me to remind you that we are recording the webinar and uh, the webinar will be available on the OECD website in a few days. Uh, without further ado, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, <coughs> Mr. Janet Spotonik. He doesn't actually require an introduction because, uh, as all of you already know, he is the father of the circular economy in Europe. He is uh, the co-chair of the UN International Resource Panel. He is former Slovenian Minister for European Affairs and is also former European Commissioner for Environment. During his term at the Commission, he initiated the European Resource Efficiency Platform that led to the adoption of the first European Circular Economy Package. So, Mr. Potonik, again, we are really glad to have you with us today, and the floor is yours for your intervention. Thank you, Stefano. I will start sharing the screen. Can you please enable me that because I'm currently disabled? I, I think it's, can you do it now? Uh, just a second, I will try again. Yeah, now it's possible, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. By the way, you have not given me an easy task because uh, measurement of the circular economy, in particular, if you locate, locate it in the specific area like the city, it's not something which is in particular easy. But I will try to give you a bit of uh, a bit of uh, flavor. <clears throat> what are the most important things one needs to take into account? First, two things which are important that we keeping considerations, and we have heard them already during the seminar till now. Cities and regions are important from two particular points. One is that they have high relative autonomy of the governance, so they do not so much depend on uh, national governance or on the global governance. And of course, as we have heard also in previous session, they are closer to people. Second, many transitional problems and opportunities are actually concentrated in the cities. That's why they make them, and also the focus on the cities and the regions, so important. The second thing which I would like to put in the center of our attention, it's linked to the natural resources management. Why? Because they provide the foundation for the goods, services, and infrastructure that make up our current socio-economic systems. When in the International Resource Panel we are addressing them, we talk about biomass, we talk about metals, we talk about fossil fuels, about non-metallic minerals. Normally we use a kind of joint expression materials, but we also talk about water and land, which are also part of natural resources. Why this is so important? There is a challenge that resource extraction and processing only without a consumption included cause massive environmental and health problems. For example, we have calculated that 90% of land-related global biodiversity loss and water stress are connected to that, that 50% of the global climate change impacts are connected to that, and even one-third of the air pollution health impacts. So if you are buying a car, if you are parking it for the whole life, not using it, actually you have already caused one third of the air pollution because resources needs to be extracted and the car needs to be produced. So when we were looking to the trends in the last 50 years and also to the trends in the future, we found out that if the current trends would continue, the global material consumption is predicted to double by 2060. We have seen that 
global resource use has more than tripled since 1970. So in last 50 years, that global material demand per capita has almost doubled, which means that a lot of that could be directly connected to economic development rather than to the growth of population. And finally, that material productivity, which is the measurement which we are normally using, uh, which is expressing the efficiency of the use of, uh, of materials per unit of GDP, which is naturally growing in all countries, was on a global level growing till the year 2000 and then started and to decline and to stagnate in the last years. Why so? Because a lot of the products which we are wearing, buying, using, were before produced in more resource efficient countries like Europe, like Japan, like United States. And now the production has shifted to the countries which are less resource efficient, like, for example, Indonesia, China, India, and so on. That nothing is wrong. I'm just trying to give you the, the, the essence of the, of the, of the challenge which we are all, uh, which we are all uh, uh, facing. The goal is thus to fundamentally improve the material productivity. So improve the well-being within the planetary boundaries. And what we are, uh, what we, what we believe it should be the core part of the solution which should be measured in a systemic way is that the future well-being development growth and economic activity growth should be decoupled from the growth of the resource use and both should be decoupled from environmental impacts. What would be the pathway? I think the, the most important thing which we need to keep into our mind is that we would fundamentally need to shift from something which is today GDP driven and it is pretty much following the product maximization to providing in the first place the human needs and productivity improvements at scale. If I, if I, to, to be, to be precise, we actually don't need cars. We need mobility. We don't need light bulbs. We need light. We don't need chairs. We need to sit. We don't need refrigerators. We need chilled and healthy food. We don't need CDs. We want to listen to the music. This has actually already become the reality. We don't need pesticides. We need healthy plants. So dematerialization, rethinking the ownership, moving from thinking, which is currently still very much present, linked to efficiency, also to the sufficiency questions. All that should, according to me, be part of our circular economy 2.0 question. When we have very recently released uh, uh, research, which was uh, pretty much addressing the question of the cars and of the housing in the context of the climate change, we came with quite interesting and not very comfortable conclusions. For example, in G7, which was in the center of our address, uh, the one of the conclusions is that while, while repair resource recycling are important to reduce life cycle GHG emissions, reducing floor space through more intensive use has by far more potential. So what it's important when we look to the measurement is that that we look the circular economy as well as was already explained by some of the previous speakers in a in a uh, in in a system way so it should be seen as an instrument actually for delivering the coupling which i was talking about before it should be seen as part of the bigger picture of this economic societal and cultural transformation needed to deliver also the sustainable development goals so this system approach is actually needed and should be in the center this leads me to the measurement. We should consider circular economy as a tool. A circular metrics must feed into and also improve the bigger picture. So what is most important is to keep the consistency. So while we have the goal of well-being within the planetary boundaries, the pathway, circular economy, potential metrics, and this is just to explain the logic which I try to, uh, to defend, is that on one hand, we should be developing the well-being metrics connected to health, education, safety, community, non-loneliness, income equality. So going beyond the GDP, if you want something which is not actually in the city's merit, but it should be considered uh, more nationally or even I would say on a global level. 
And then also the measurement there, which is connected to planetary matrix and planetary boundaries, GAG footprints, biodiversity footprints, pollution footprints, rare materials footprints, water print footprints. And when it comes then to circular economy, this should be consistent with the logic which I'm explaining. So measuring design and demand balance metrics, for example. For example, demand need for mobility based on the urban design demand for new houses per person, or utilization, wastefulness matrix, for example, utilization of key assets such as housing, such as mobility, or material use or reuse matrix, lifetime of products, repair rates, reuse rates, recycling and waste. To conclude, I, and I want basically to conclude with, with two crucial reports which are showing the circular way forward in the cities. One is the OECD report. I think Oriana will talk about that more in detail lately. It's pretty much clearly showing what are the problems. So important key findings of that report are that there is a lack of an agreed definition of circular economy. There is no harmonized measurement framework. There is incomplete information. There is a strong focus on waste, but little on closing the loops that there is available indicators are mostly data-driven rather than objective-driven. So in summary, there is a lack of a systemic approach for the circular economy indicators. And the report which we have also released a few years ago in the IRP, which talks about the weight of the cities, which is more talking about the solutions which needs to be actually monitored and how we would need to put them in the center of our activity. So in that report, we talk about four-level framework to achieve the factor 10 resource productivity. Compact urban form, not in the sense of, uh, not in the sense of very high density, but rather in the sense of smart non-fragmentation. Livable functionality and socially mixed neighborhoods, small mixed block create accessibility and conditions for walking and cycling over motorized transport, energy efficient buildings and urban systems, including smarter space efficient multi-unit houses, and finally resource efficient consumption, including better recycling, repair, and less energy use. So in summary, success measure should actually be an integrated resource productivity rather than having a focus on some only particular measures. That would be for the introduction. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Potonik. It was uh, really interesting. Also, this approach based on well-being, a systemic approach and integrated approach that is also what we are using at the OCD for our other uh, framework. There are uh, a couple of questions. One is, uh, um, would you define a utilage uh, under productivity in, uh, in your approach to circular economy? Would I define utility under productivity? Ut utilage? Utilization, utilization I think. probably utilization, it's utilization, probably, yeah. Yes. Under productivity. Uh, yeah, certainly utilization, it's an important part of the, of the question. If you look uh, to the problem of mobility today, uh, while uh, there it's easy to agree that, uh, that uh, for example, replacing the combustion engine cars with the electric cars, it's an important part of the solution. It is absolutely not the essential part. Because if we are, for example, according to data, using a typical private owned European car, uh, that it's 92% actually parked, that 1.6% it's looking for parking, 1% is sitting in congestion and 5% we are driving it. And even that 5%, it's 1.5 person in the car, which is normally a five seater. This means that we are utilizing the cars and the resources, which are of course in that cars approximately per two, 2%. So utilization, it's important part of the solution. And I think that we have to look exactly in, in that systemic way, like it was explained before, and also you have underlined. Thank you. And maybe a second uh, question is more a reflection than a question that I see in the chat, but uh, can be relevant for the discussion is uh, uh, well-being metrics and planetary boundary. It sounds like the uh, donut economy. What do, do you see a linkage between uh, your... Uh... Sure, sure. There is a linkage uh, donut economy. It's a nice concept. Uh, I like it. And um, uh, what I mentioned before, I think it's, you know, currently 
also in majority of our activities which we do also inside the climate talks we are more focusing on how to clean the existing production which is again an important part of the answer but i think it is essential that we in the first place ask ourselves what of that what we produce is actually needed to fulfill human needs and some some of the things could be organized in in totally different way so before going to the question does it need to be clean up let's ask ourselves can we reduce some of the use of natural resources can we organize them in our economy in different way which would then also mean that less of the cleaning would be needed and i think that uh, that this is part of the debate which is pretty much still meeting is still missing in the boardroom sent also in our governments but it's an essential part of the solution because our real problem it's really the economic system which we have created and how to make so the vision and the goals are clear but how to make the step change which is needed to fulfill those goals and commitments that's the real question which it's at stake you and i see another couple of questions so your presentation really uh, mobilized a lot of interest the first one is uh, uh, from uh, Carl Wright. He, uh, he was alarmed to read uh, recently about the massive and growing use of energy resources involved in the production of bitcoin are you are any international action possible to control this uh, wasteful use of resources which will clearly impact on climate and circular econ economy including local effort to reach uh, zero carbon sooner than later uh, solution will be not only possible but needed and uh, i can continue but that's the answer <laughs> okay thank you and the last one before we move to uh, to ariana for our representation uh, would it be feasible to set a definition for essential uses towards uh, that fundamental shift that you mentioned in your representation? This is not an easy question. I think uh, uh, it deserves a bit more than just my thinking uh, around those things. Uh, I just wanted to set the scene and point the direction in which we need to collectively work. Uh, and I think it is, it is not an easy issue, <coughs> sorry, me measurement of circularity in particular because it's not an easy issue to measure any systemic change but uh, we have to try harder and we have to start from the top and uh, starting from the top it's for me always uh, finally really starting and not only by us but by the major monetary institutions uh, by major institutions in europe like the commission that we seriously move beyond the gdp because i think this is essential and this is the first building block in which the whole system change is standing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Potonik, for the presentation and for addressing uh, all these questions. Um, I will now move to uh, Oriana, and that uh, I'm sure everybody of you knows very well. Oriana is the uh, coordinator of the OECD program on circular economy in cities and regions. And uh, she will now make a presentation, uh, an overview of the OECD scoreboard on the governance of circular economy in cities and regions and the inventory of circular economy indicators. Oriana, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Stefano, and thank you very much, Janet, for uh, your inspiring presentation. It's always it's, it's very difficult to talk after your presentation indeed, but I will try to... to to provide some inputs in continuation of what you just said and avoid uh, any sort of uh, repetition on why we need to measure and uh, and um, and uh, how how to get there as uh, as you did uh, so so well so let's uh, let's see how i can complement my presentation is indeed on the OECD scoreboard on the governance of the circular economy in cities and regions and the idea is to share uh, a bit uh, our path towards uh, this uh, scoreboard and to analyze the, how to analyze uh, how uh, the OECD is supporting governments at different levels, so national, regional, and uh, local, to have an understanding of the progress towards uh, the implementation of this transition from a linear to a circular system. So, if we go to the next slide. Uh, 
is to say that uh, since the beginning of the program of the OECD program on the circular economy in cities and regions, we looked at the issue of measurement as a request from uh, the governments we worked with uh, to have uh, some sort of uh, clarification on some sort of uh, framework to look at to have a better understanding of the progress. So governments uh, were embarking on the transition from a linear to circular economy, but fair enough, they wanted also to have an understanding of the progress that they were making and the impact that they were uh, achieving. This is also to raise awareness uh, and as it was mentioned before, to build consensus over the role of several stakeholders, like for example, the private sectors and the citizens, and to show that the circular economy is really having positive impact on quality of life, on jobs creation, on environmental aspect. But how to get there uh, has been uh, always a big question mark. So in order to, to help, uh, we started to look at uh, what was already existing. And thanks to the work of my colleague in particular, Andre Zaire, uh, we um, analyzed more than 400 indicators belonging to 30 existing uh, uh, circular economy strategy to really understand what are these indicators available, what cities, regions and national governments are measuring when they refer to monitoring frameworks in relation to the circular economy. And analyzing all these indicators, we found out that the majority of uh, indicators relate to, relate to environment, 39%. And this means uh, collecting indicators with uh, a direct impact on the ecosystem, uh, such as emissions, uh, output material process, uh, production and consumption. A good 34% related to governance aspect. So meaning uh, focusing on indicators in relation to education, capacity building, and regulation, among others. Uh, then uh, we identify the category of economic and business, which includes indicators expressed in monetary units, such as value added of the circular economy, public investment in circular economy project, and those indicators that focus specifically on activities performed by and within companies. Um, uh, 80 eight percent related to infrastructural and technology indicators, so like for example, the existence of technologies and spaces that boost the circular economy uh, in cities and regions. And then 5% gathers indicators associated with employment and human resources. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, uh, to give you an idea that yes, environment uh, indicators prevail, but uh, uh, contrary to what we can think, it's not, of course, only about waste. Waste represents the 20% of the inventory and indicators concern both the waste generation and the management. Uh, many uh, circular economy strategies distinguish across categories of waste, such as bio waste, plastic waste, electric waste. And when it comes to the treatment, there is a differentiation between landfill, incinerated waste, recycled waste, and a number of composting plants. The problem is that if we look into the uh, specifics of these indicators, they are all different to one another. And that's why uh, uh, when Janet was mentioning the lack of harmonized framework as one of the uh, uh, conclusion of the challenge is uh, exactly this. It's not about, the aim is not to compare necessarily, but also to harmonize some definition, which would be important to have an understanding of uh, global progress. And I would also like to raise your attention on these 31% uh, that we identified as circular economy indicators, because they are indicators included in circular economy strategies related not to uh, a specific sector, but rather to 
uh, the novelty that uh, the, the circular economy can bring, for example, in terms of uh, uh, companies, so a number of companies that received the financial assistance related to circular economy, this is one uh, generic indicator that is not sector specific, or for example, another circular economy indicator is the number of city contracts evaluated using circular economy principles. This is a, a good point in the sense that, uh, as mentioned before, many of the data that or indicators that are included in uh, circular economy strategies are very much data driven, meaning that some of the data and indicators already available on waste, air emission or uh, uh, material flow, for example, now they are part of monitoring framework. But there is also an innovation in all these, and especially when it comes to these non sector specific indicators that we identified as a circular economy related one and that are more objective driven and allow us cities and regions and national governments who have an understanding of the overall situation towards, uh, for example, financial, financial resources or regulation or capacity building programs that have been uh, uh, defined and developed with the specific purpose of uh, uh, implementing circular economy strategies. Next slide is uh, um, a slide on uh, the OECD inventory of circular economy indicators. So these data and indicators that I just mentioned, you can find in uh, this uh, uh, study uh, that is available online. The team is, is sharing the link. It contains uh, more than 400 indicators from several circular economy studies and strategies. Uh, next slide is to now move uh, from uh, what we learned then from this indicator, this inventory has been for us a way to have an understanding of uh, the overall uh, uh, panorama uh, around uh, circular economy measurement, and also to have an understanding of uh, how we could uh, mostly um, support uh, government uh, in uh, their achievement towards the transition to a circular economy. So in uh, the OECD report on circular economy in cities and regions, we came up with uh, a checklist for action, which is the result of several case studies that we implemented at city level in Spain, in uh, Netherlands, in Sweden, and now in the UK in Ireland, but also uh, the um, uh, the, the work with more than uh, uh, 300 stakeholders to have an understanding on how to develop a circular economy, uh, a circular economy transition. And so we identified 12 uh, dimensions based on uh, previous OECD work on, uh, for example, principles on urban policies or uh, principles on water governance that help really governments to have an understanding of the key dimension that need to take into account if they want to move towards this transition. And uh, this is okay in theory, in practice, if we go to the, to the next slide, we also wanted to uh, provide a scoreboard, so a tool uh, through which uh, a government could assess uh, the level of implementation of those uh, dimensions that goes from uh, 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 assessing clear roles and responsibilities for the circular economy to develop specific capacities, but also to develop a uh, uh, circular economy strategy. In fact, if we go to the next slide, uh, you can find an example of the scoreboard, uh, which is a traffic light going from uh, for each of the 12 dimension. And in this case, you have uh, the dimension in relation to the strategic vision on uh, where the city, the region or the national government stands towards uh, planning a certain action until uh, uh, having this action in place and uh, effectively achieved. But how to do this uh, measurement and this self-assessment? Assess we can go to the next slide, which is also the last one. Uh, I found this uh, uh, phrase nice to express 
what is behind the self-assessment methodology, which is uh, there is no ego in eco, meaning that it's not always only the national, the local or the regional government to assess uh, where they stand and what it is needed uh, to uh, move from a circular, from a linear to a circular economy, but it's very much a shared responsibility. So in order to develop the self-assessment, it is important to map stakeholders, to discuss and agree on the scores, so to have an understanding of where the progress are from planned to effectively uh, implemented activities and this would help to define what works what doesn't work what needs to be improved but also what is the role played by all the stakeholders in a shared responsibilities because at the end of the day the business sector the citizens the association the ngos are the real doers and implementers of this transition I'll stop here and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Oriana. Thank you very much. Uh, now, before moving to the panel, we would like to hear from the audience on the theme of this session on circular cities and regions, how to measure progress. Uh, please answer. Um, I'm waiting for the OECD team to put the, the, the Zoom uh, question on the screen. And the question that we would like to ask uh, to the uh, audience through our Zoom poll is, in your opinion, where are the biggest data gaps in measuring circularity? And uh, you have uh, two, uh, possible two possible responses are, are allowed. So the first one is uh, environmental indicators, economic indicators, societal indicators, governance indicator, infrastructure related indicators, and material flow indicators. We have now uh, 17, 20% of the uh, participant uh, voted. You see, for the moment, material flows indicator seems to be the main uh, data gaps, uh, followed by societal indicators. Let's continue to respond. Still material flows indicator with 60% uh, is uh, the main uh, data gaps, uh, societal indicators, uh, then governance and environmental indicators are also very relevant gaps. We have uh, 55, 56% of the uh, participant to vote in now. So, Still material flows, social indicators, followed by environmental and governance indicator. I think this is very useful and very relevant for uh, uh, our, uh, our program on circular economy. I think we can stop uh, perhaps the, uh, the Zoom here. Or we can wait. Uh, okay, so material flows indicator, followed by societal indicators and environmental and governance indicator are the, uh, the main result. Um, now, uh, uh, let's move to the, to the panel discussion and I'm really delighted to introduce uh, our distinguished uh, guest. We have uh, uh, first uh, Mrs. Uh, José Chasson, Director of uh, Economic Department, uh, City of uh, Montreal, Canada. We have uh, uh, now Ms. Naomi Clark from uh, the Sustainability and Climate Change Officer from the City of Dundee. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Jarko Avas, who is the lead insight and analysis at uh, the Ellen McCarter Foundation. So let's start with uh, uh, Suze uh, Chasson. Uh, the city of Montreal uh, recently joined the OECD program on circular economy, and we are really uh, glad that uh, you're part of the consortium and is focusing uh, especially on the use of the OECD scoreboard to inform uh, Montreal Future Circular Economy Strategy. Uh, my question for you, Jose, is uh, what are the drivers for the transition in the city and the main data gaps? Uh, you have five minutes to uh, address the question. Jose, the floor is yours. Mm. Bonjour à tous. Uh, I'm very glad and very happy to be here with you uh, to share some Montreal perspective on the circular economy topic. And also I have to say that we are delighted to join the OEC, the circular economy program. So uh, we're really looking forward to work uh, with you uh, because we need all the tools to go faster. 
And this is also possible, this collaboration, uh, because we, uh, we work also with the Ministère des Relations Internationales et de la Francophonie du Québec. So thank you very much also to, to them. Um, a consensus is emerging from the health and economic crisis. Actually, uh, today we everybody say recovery must be green, inclusive, and local. So uh, the circular economy is certainly a way to achieve it. So for us, we have been working on it for years now, but I, we believe that this is a, a really good momentum to, to bring it to another level. So, so to answer probably the question, uh, we believe uh, in our, from our Montreal perspective that the, there's like five key drivers uh, for the transition to the city. Um, first, uh, it's basic, but it's very important. Uh, it takes a strong political leadership. So it has to be um, from the top. Um, and uh, in Montreal, for instance, our leader at the city are really aiming to position the city as a leader in North America and on the topic of the circular economy. So, so it gives us all the, uh, the, the, the power after that to, to, to bring it to another level. So, so this is very important. Um, and also uh, uh, it takes a lot of courage and power to make changes and new regulation, new way of doing things. Uh, trial and error, because this is also a part of the process. Uh, so, uh, so as I just said, it takes a strong political leadership. So that's the first one. The second one, uh, we would, I would say that it takes a perfect alignment within the, the various cities' uh, different plans, as, because you know, you know, cities are big organization. There's a lot of different services. So we need to have a perfect alignment. So I'm thinking about uh, this, like the, the city strategic plan. So the city vision, we, has to, we have to take to put the econ uh, circular economy at the art or at least in a strategic place in all these plans. I'm thinking about the climate plan because you know, a lot of cities now are getting climate plan uh, for instance, in Montreal, we did uh, adopt our first climate plan last year with a very ambitious uh, target to, to reduce to 55% uh, the uh, green, green, uh, greenhouse gas So, so if, uh, by 2030. So it, it's massive. So, so but uh, yeah, circular economy is in the art of that plan also. Residual material management, uh, also sustainable procurement. I, 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 we, we hear uh, earlier on other presentations, the importance of you know, the cities buying also, uh, the way they are buying uh, their product and services. So, and, and of course, uh, in the economic recovery plan also, I think uh, in Montreal, what is particular, we are driving the, uh, like the economic development, the department is actually driving the uh, the uh, the circular economy uh, roadmap that we want to uh, to achieve. So so I think it's very important it, that it's also economic driven. So so that's you know all when with all the plans aligned, it makes that all the services are working together because we have things uh, we have uh, share goals and uh, we are all working towards the same goal. So it helps a lot. And I would also add that the, it needs a perfect alignment with the different levels of government. Uh, for instance, uh, in the economic, uh, we, like we have a, um, a joint metropolis uh, economic plan with the government of Quebec. So it helps a lot to avoid silos and, and maximize the synergy and the value that we create. So. So that was my second point. The third point, um, it will be a strong engaged ecosystem because uh, knowing and mobilizing the ecosystem is very important uh, in order to transform our economy. We need to work all together. So everyone has a role to play. So, so the cities, I think, has a, a role to, uh, 
to federate and to lead this uh, mobilization. So for instance, financing different type of organization that is actually supporting directly businesses to transform their uh, practices, but also to, to work with uh, economic development organization that is actually doing workshop with business with the business community to create awareness, to, to, to also uh, create uh, uh, different partnership within business because sometimes, you know, it's just uh, between businesses that could be some uh, circular economy uh, opportunities. So, um, the fourth key driver uh, is sustainable financing solution. Uh, we have to rethink also the way we finance and also to have more appropriate financing terms for the businesses because sometimes the, the return on investment is different. Uh, is longer. So, so, so I think we need a financing ecosystem that is also aware about uh, these uh, challenges that the businesses are facing. And, uh, and that's one of the key drivers. Uh, in Montreal, we, we recently uh, did a partnership with Fonds d'Action, which is a private investment fund. Uh, to set up the first circular economy fund in Canada, so with the capitalization of 30 million. So it's dedicated to finance business that has a circular economy project with really appropriate uh, term of financing. So that was, uh, we're really glad because this partnership. I, I invite you to conclude that, please. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the, the, the last one was actually uh, the common roadmap. So, so this is uh, the very important for the, uh, for the, that everything is coming. So this is the collaboration that we're gonna do with OECD to, to go farther and get better data so we can uh, put forward the opportunities uh, within our community. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Very much again in the OECD program on economy. So to Naomi, um, Dundee has been using the uh, OECD scoreboard to track progress towards the circular economy, focusing in particular on the governance aspect needed to set up a long-term vision for the city. So Naomi, can you, can you please tell us what are the lessons learned from this exercise? You have the floor, Naomi. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Naomi Clark. I work for Dundee City Council in Scotland. Um, we launched our climate action plan, citywide climate action plan, um, in December 2019. And one of the, the main actions in the plan was to develop a circular economy strategy for the, the city. Um, currently, we support Circular Tayside, which is a network of businesses looking to reduce their waste and redesign the processes um, based on circular principles. And there's about 50 organisations involved in that. There's also a lot of um, circular projects and activities in the city, um, big and small, huge projects and small projects, but there's no overarching um, strategy. Um, we're not all kind of working together just yet. Um, so also, as far as a local authority, we have not embedded a uh, circularity within the council services, um, in particular procurement, waste and transport. Um, so the scoreboard matrix was a really useful tool for us to kind of uh, bring everyone together in the room and help us uh, define a baseline. Uh, where are we just now? Um, initially, we're just looking within the local authority um, and then we can kind of work out with, with collaborate with the rest of the city. Um, it was also really useful for, for, for really engaging uh, different departments. Um, allowing us to kind of provide in the, the framework that we need um, because it is such a huge subject. Um, I think it's uh, kind of difficult to know where to start as a council. So it was a really useful, um, provide, provided a really useful framework and helped us to work out not only where we are, but where we need to be and who needs to be involved in that process. 
Um, so from using the, the matrix, we can see that we're actually already really strong on engagement um, and collaboration. So we're, we're talking to, to various parties, um, you know, there's a real willingness to move this forward. Um, it's just kind of where do we start? And that, that's where the, the tool was really useful. Um, so we know that uh, a lot needs to be done on uh, kind of data and assessment, uh, strategic vision, um, innovation and financing. That were the main kind of uh, take home points from, from using the tool. Um, I think we, we are currently trying to model the, the carbon emissions of our climate action plan um, using um, uh, emissions modeling software. And there's a real gap in that software for waste reduction and circular economy um, kind of based reduction. Um, so this is the tool that we are going to be using um, with the lack of that, those kind of metrics um, to monitor um, our kind of circular economy progress in the, the local authority and the city. Um, and also, I should say, it provides a really positive uh, kind of basis for a shared understanding across the city of what we need to do. Um, so the tool itself, and along with examples from other cities like Glasgow, um, who are much more further down the line than us, um, will really help us kind of um, pull it all together and progress. Um, so, so yeah, I think uh, it's it's really provided a, a catalyst for bringing together the, the right stakeholders to start really developing the strategy and, and pull everything together because, like I say, there's a lot of work being done, it's just not pulled together in a, in a strategy Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi, also for uh, staying in the five minutes. Uh, let's now move to Jarko from the Alec MacArthur Foundation. So Jarko, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has been uh, accompanying the business sector in uh, measuring progress toward the circular economy. Uh, the question for you is, uh, what are the main characteristics of this measurement framework and uh, how it is linked with the territorial dimension and more precisely with the cities? Can you elaborate a bit on this in uh, five minutes, Jarko? Sure. Thank you, Stefano. Um, I'll flip those questions around, but I'll address both. Um, but um, to, to start with, uh, we have indeed worked a lot with the private sector on measuring circular economy performance on a company level. And we have now um, a little bit over a thousand companies that we work with that are using our tool uh, to do just that. So, so I'm bringing some sort of learnings and insights from that and, and how we've thought about linking the learnings from, from that uh, piece of work to, to the public sector. And, and for example, cities. Um, and I think the most important thing, and, and uh, for example, Mr. Potosnik already touched upon many of these things, so it was a fantastic opening, but it is to make sure that we talk about the same circular economy. Uh, that makes it so much easier to, to link uh, activities and ways to measure things on different levels. So uh, the way we talk about circular economies is three things. It's about eliminating waste, it's about keeping materials and, and products in use and at as, as high value as possible at uh, for as long as possible. Um, and, and then finally, it's about regenerating natural systems. Um, we also heard from Mr. Potosnik about uh, resource use uh, doubling uh, until 2060. And it's, that's why it's important to, to uh, decouple from finite resource use which means that we will be moving more to, to renewable materials uh, and, and therefore regenerating natural systems is, uh, is an important part of, of a circular economy. So given that those definitions and, and sort of aspirations of circular economy are shared, measurement falls into place much more easily in a way that, that the different levels of, of measuring talk to each other. And um, with those three sort of components of circular economy, I think the sort of basis is, is imp what's important is to move away from sort of the recycling agenda as we can't recycle our way out of, uh, of, of a linear economy. We can only buy time uh, by recycling, but it's important that we um, innovate, for example, upstream solutions. So we have products and systems that, that are inherently circular rather than trying to fix uh, at the end of the line when, when we need to recycle materials. So. So it's, it's, it's a broader concept 
than that to, to make it work. Uh, and some of the systemic aspects have already been, been discussed as well. Um, with, with the shared definitions and, and moving away from sort of just recycling, um, what we've found useful is to talk about three different things to measure. And, and I see a lot of this is, is for example, in, uh, in the OECD's work already, collection of indicators and the checklist for action and, and so on. Um, the first one of, of these three sort of measurement buckets is uh, the enabling conditions. Um, it's an early topic for many circular economy. And, and so measuring how uh, well the enabling conditions have been put in place to be more circular in the future is, is perhaps the first thing to, to focus on. And these are things like um, innovation for circular economy. Uh, what uh, Montreal, I think, was looking at is, uh, is at leadership ownership uh, of, of the topic, or decision maker ownership of the topic. Um, some systemic factors like collaboration has been discussed many times already in this session, but it's really important as we're talking about the economy. Everybody needs to move roughly at the same pace for change to happen and collaboration is an important enabling uh, factor. Once those are in place, we can then measure circular economy outcomes. And this is what we mostly talk about when we measure circular economy, right? It's about material flows. It's about using renewable energy to achieve those circular material flows. Um, it's about also water flows, making sure that uh, water is recirculated and, and we don't sort of uh, destroy the water system, natural water systems. Um, and it's also about finance. It could be an enabling condition, but especially when we talk about company level measurement, um, we talk about uh, the financing of circular economy as, as an outcome already, but it's a nuance where, where you would put that. And then the third bucket is, is impacts. Um, it's been already mentioned that the circular economy is a means to ends, and, and it's important that we link that in measurement as well. So showing how circular economy levers can deliver positive climate outcomes biodiversity outcomes and social impacts beyond just GDP uh, is indeed something we, we try to, to measure also on the company level. Um, and um, looking at, for example, the OECD indicators, a lot of this is already in there and perhaps sort of talking about the same categories under the same definitions is, is something that, that would help uh, link measurement on city level to, to measurement on, on the company level. Um, Is that uh, conclude, Jarko, now? Yeah, I can conclude there. Thank you, thank you yes. very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Jarko. Sorry, but we are running a bit uh, late. Uh, let's now move to the last uh, speaker. Uh, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Peter Borki. He's the principal administrator from the environmental director of the OECD. And uh, Peter will give us an overview of the state of the art of indicators and the OECD work in monitoring progress towards uh, a resource efficient and circular economy. Peter, you have the floor if you can stay in seven, uh, 10 minutes maximum. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Stefano, for the kind introduction and I will try to be as short as I can. Um, I, I think, you know, this uh, uh, session has been extremely rich. So a, a lot of things, of course, have already been, been said um, it is clear that, you know, measurement is absolutely, absolutely crucial uh, for, for the effective management uh, of the circular economy transition. You cannot manage what you can't measure. Um, I think as uh, I think, uh, you know, some of the panelists also say, I mean, the circular economy, because it is a systemic shift, is also uh, uh, probably a, a trial and error process and I think you know it's it's important that we pick up errors as early as possible and correct them uh, and and then again you know uh, measurement of course is is important and measurement is important at at different levels we've heard about the city level about the national level uh, we've heard about the the, the firm level um, finance uh, you know is another one um, so uh, you know at the OECD, we of course take a keen interest uh, in, in measurement. Um, you know, from the perspective of an international organization, um, you know what I think is particularly important uh, is is also the comparability 
of data uh, that enables uh, comparative analysis, which is which is one of the key areas of activity uh, uh, for the for the OECD, but it's also important for 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 other stakeholders. Of course, everyone wants to benchmark themselves and and to see where they stand, and and for that the comparability. Um, uh, of data is also uh, data and, and, and indicators uh, is also important. Um, I, I have a couple of, of, of slides. I will really only go very quickly through them if I can have the first one, maybe. You know, I think as, as previous speakers have said, you know, uh, what is it really that needs to be measured? Um, you know, uh, typically, you know, we want to measure the inputs and the outputs of the system. We want to measure um, how those um, uh, material inputs uh, circulate uh, through the economy and, and, and how, you know, uh, sort of the, the circularity of the economy also progresses, which is called here on the slide, the R strategies. I should say this is a, a, a graphic uh, from the Dutch uh, Environmental Agency. And then, um, you know, we want to, to, to measure the, the effects because, of course, it's very nice if uh, this, you know, if our economy becomes more circular, but ultimately what we want is that circularity to deliver improvements in the state of environment, uh, but also uh, economic and social outcomes. Uh, if I can have the, the next slide. Um, and uh, uh, we've also heard, uh, you know, that um, we are not quite there yet. Um, so this is a very nice graphic from PACE, uh, the platform acceler for accelerating the circular economy. It's just done a very nice report um, uh, where they take stock of, of circular economy uh, data and, and, and indicators. Um, and, and it's from this, what you can see is, you know, that uh, we we ha already have quite quite you know some uh, data and indicators available, but they're sort of mostly uh, you know the input and output uh, indicators, so waste indicators, recycling indi indicators, material flow indicators, which become increasingly available. But then, uh, you know, it, it becomes, uh, you know, more, more difficult and uh, we have very little data and indicators that allow us to measure, you know, sort of R strategies, as we call them, uh, you, know, uh, you know, higher R strategies other than recycling, essentially, so reuse, um, you know, refurbishment, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, I think... Uh, with the scoreboard, uh, there is there is a, a major step forward on on just what uh, Oriana called the uh, governance indicators, um, policy and process indicators. Here, I think I think that that's a major contribution. And then, of course, where we we have major deficiencies is in how we then uh, connect the uh, all you know all the previous indicators to the actual goals and outcomes that we're trying to achieve, the environmental, economic, and social uh, outcomes. Um, and uh, this is, uh, you know, not a big surprise because, uh, of course, all our indicators uh, that we currently use have essentially been designed for a linear economy. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a bit of a, of a, of a recast uh, that, that, that's needed there. Um, uh, I think there has been uh, quite a few things said already about the reasons uh, why uh, this is the situation. Uh, of course, there's a, you know there are data challenges, um, there are methodological uh, challenges, um, uh, and um, uh, you know. But the good news is um, that there's also now increasing activity. Uh, 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 both at the international and at the national level, but also, of course, subnational levels uh, to address uh, this uh, situation. Um, uh, we are actually, uh, you know, working with a, with a number of uh, international uh, activities. There is, um, you know, at, at the EU level, the Bellagio process, which has developed uh, Bellagio principles uh, for the measurement of circular economy transition. 
uh, I've already men mentioned Pace, um, which uh, which has done stock take and also provide provides a platform, at, uh, you know, for dialogue at different levels, um, and uh, and then there's the um, uh, the UN Commission, uh, Economic Commission for Europe, um, which has set up a task force on measuring circular economy, uh, and which is under the auspices of the Conference of European Statist Statisticians. So, so uh, uh, we're we're strongly connected to them and working uh, with them. And if I can have the next slide, maybe. Um, so what, what we have uh, set out to do uh, through two of our policy communities in the, envir uh, in the Environmental Policy um, uh, Committee, uh, which is essentially uh, our waste experts and our uh, environmental statistics experts uh, coming together. Uh, these are the two things that, that we want to do. We want to... Um, uh, develop a harmonized framework for monitoring progress and, and supporting policy development and evaluation. And we want to develop, uh, you know, uh, some guidance on, on how to produce and use and communicate circular economy information. Unfortunately, there's no time to go into any of the details, but um, maybe let me say that this is going to be very challenging. <laughs> um, it's not going to be easy um, and it will take time. Um, uh, we will be able to develop uh, some indicators um, that will be highly operational because uh, data is already available and uh, there, there's some progress that can be made sort of, uh, you know, relatively quickly on, on some of them. Um, others will require a lot more time um, because, uh, and then, you know, that means that you know, some of the data and, 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 and indicators will be more aspirational. So we'll be trying to point in the direction that we should be moving into. Um, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, maybe I also identify where some alternative data sources uh, can be used. Not everything uh, needs to rely on, on national statistics, but of course, you know, that's gonna be a strong focus for us being an international organization and given, you know, the policy communities that we're bringing together. So, so I think, you know, let me just stop there. Um, I hope this is, this is useful also in, in, in showing what the OECD is gonna do uh, in, in, in the coming months and, and, and years. And, um, you know, please, please do get in touch if you want to join those efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for uh, your uh, very clear presentation. Uh, we are three minutes late, so this is uh, bringing us to the end. Uh, this presentation is bringing us to the end of the third OECD roundtable on uh, circular economy in cities and regions. Uh, I would like to thank uh, first our speaker and panelists for take contribution to the session to all the participants for uh, the active contribution. I see there are still some questions in the Q&A in the chat. The team can answer following the, the webinar. Uh, I would like to thank very much Oriana Romano, the coordinator of the uh, Circular Economy Program, and her team under Izagir, Juliette Lassman, Melissa Kerim Dikeni, and Andrea Corigi for making this roundtable uh, possible. Uh, please get in touch with them for any question you may have on the follow-up of the uh, Circular Economy Program. Uh, as a final information, the recording of all the four webinars of yesterday and today of the roundtable will be uploaded shortly in the OECD uh, webpage on the Circular Economy. So with this, I conclude uh, the third OECD roundtable. Thank you very much. Goodbye and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Goodbye.